in the last sessions we covered the first part of chapter 2 the part of chapter 2 which summarized the finest teachings of Sankhya Sankhya as you may know is the basis of yoga it is the philosophy the theory the foundation behind the practices so if yoga is the practical aspect Sankhya is the philosophical aspect we need both of these imagine you would go to a surgeon you need to have a heart surgery and you have a surgeon that has only studied books has never performed any surgery before I'm sure you don't want such a surgeon performing your surgery or you have a surgeon that's been operating on lots of cadavers but has no clear foundation of the theory behind it he doesn't know exactly what he's doing you wouldn't want that either we need to have both even in yoga you need to have a solid foundation so the first part of chapter 2 provided this foundation where Sri Krishna summarized all the teachings of the Upanishads the essence of the Upanishads captured it for Arjun we have often said that Sri Krishna is portrayed as a cowherd in his childhood he was often portrayed as a young boy with a lot of surrounded by cows playing a flute what is the symbolism of those cows he's a cowherd he milks the cows that milk that symbolism is that beautiful pure milk that's the food that a child gets a baby gets the first food you get is milk that is a symbol of nourishment and it captures all the nutrition that a child needs it has all this nutrition concentrated so this milk here is the milk of knowledge it is summarizing all the knowledge that you need in just a few verses <clears throat> and this milk he then gave to Arjun some of the things that were summarized to go through very briefly is the explanation that everything is transient everything is changing but there is a unalterable reality that is called consciousness Sri Krishna talked about reincarnation he talked about the idea of manifestation in Sanatan Dharma in the eternal Dharma we do not believe in creation we talk of manifestation the hidden comes forward and goes back to the unmanifest the highest truth is pure consciousness and the purpose of our life and of all our lifetimes has been to attain that highest truth and so finally we come to verse 38 and Sri Krishna says holding pleasure and pain gain and loss victory and defeat to be the same make ready for battle thus you will not incur sin 
with these words shri krishna is motivating arjun to attain that non dualistic state to become a witness a sakshi to acquire that bhava that mood of a sakshi of a witness and to hold it to be established in it and then you see all your negative qualities that have been hidden you begin to see them in the light of consciousness and when that happens you begin the battle the battle of destroying all the past samskaras the samskaras that bind you to this cycle of life death and rebirth this is not an instruction on how to behave we do not have to act like we are indifferent to pleasure or pain we do not have to pretend that we are indifferent to victory or defeat this is a bhava which comes when the self chooses the self when it comes of its own accord through the spiritual evolution that has been taking place through many many lifetimes it comes to you as a gift as an opportunity as a privilege and then do not incur sin do not give up continue and make ready for the battle prepare yourself to face those ancient samskaras the battle is the battle between those ancient that ancient alliance between samskaras and karma with all our karma we create some scars and the some scars in turn get strengthened and create more karma action creates impressions the impressions get strengthened and create more action and this is the vicious cycle that needs to be broken that is the battle you making ready for So that is verse thirty-eight. Is that clear? I hope. If there is anybody who would like to ask anything about it. So far, we did the. part about sankhya and now we are moving on to the next part which is actually the part of the practice the practical part the yoga part so in verse 39 shri krishna says this wisdom i have told you according to the philosophy of sankhya now hear it according to yoga the wisdom joined with which o son of pritha you will abandon the bondage of karma there is no loss of initiative on this path nor is there any possibility of failure even a little of this discipline protects one from great danger and fear
So all this time we have spoken about the philosophy, the theory behind this, and now Sri Krishna is going to expound on yoga itself. That wisdom which will help you attain the state of union and with which you can be free from the bondage of karma. There is no loss of initiative is what is mentioned here. I um, don't find that to be a very good translation. I would say there's simply no loss on this path. Whatever action you perform in terms of your own spiritual development is not lost. There are many young seekers, meditators who do not have a very good foundation in the theory or do not quite understand the theory. And for some of these young seekers, they get very tensed about their practice. They feel that they have to attain in this lifetime, else all is lost. This idea comes perhaps from a certain modern world view. While not all of us are coming from Christian backgrounds, some of us are, but not all, still a modern life, a lot of people have acquired this unconsciously and passively, this, this idea that who knows about next life? They are not sure about reincarnation. They say, and rightly so, we don't know it, we have not experienced it. For us, this is all we have, this lifetime. With keeping this idea in mind, many young Seekers create a lot of pressure and tension for themselves. Wanting to attain the highest states of consciousness in this lifetime itself. While this is a very good and noble goal and purpose to have, this can create undue pressure for oneself. We need to find the right balance. If you know and you understand this clearly, whatever you do will occur to you. It, all the merit that you perform in terms of meditation, for example, good deeds, these accrue to you. This is the only thing you will carry forward to your next life even to the subtle planes of consciousness. In the earlier verses, we spoke about heaven and I explained that there are different planes of consciousness. When you do not have a body, when you are a disembodied soul, you experience the lokas. These are the different planes of consciousness. In common parlance, we call it heaven. There's not just one heaven, there are heavens, there are different levels of consciousness. And you would enjoy these if you have attained something. So nothing is lost. There is no possibility of failure. Because that merit is always carried forward to another lifetime. You will get a higher birth, a more conducive birth, a birth which is conducive to spiritual development and growth. Some people are afraid sometimes that if they perform certain deeds, they may fall, fall in inverted commas, I say, fall from from a human birth to an animal birth. That is indeed possible if you perform some very wicked deeds. 
acquire very, very negative animal-like samskaras. But that is quite possibly uh, the exception. Generally, evolution is moving in one direction. The direction is towards pure consciousness. Oh, hi, I have something. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that we are in one of these heavens and we are, don't even know it and we are searching for, I mean, is it? Right now. Yes. And you said there are multiple levels of, you know, layers of heaven that one can, one can be in. Do you have a body? Do you have a body? Yes. <laughs> then you're not yeah. in heaven. Okay. Of course, when you are dreaming, you are firmly convinced of the fact that you also have a body. But then you wake up. And then you realize, oh, I was dreaming. So if you consider that, yes, it's possible. Okay. That question is a bit, you know, it's a kind of like the some of the Buddhist philosophies of the Vijayanavada uh, school, they were extremely theoretical and they debated these matters of dream stages and, and waking and deep sleep and levels of consciousness and there were a lot of debates around this. Which is why I'm not so keen on <laughs> getting into that debate. The answer, the truthful answer to that is, no one knows. You could very well be in one of those levels of consciousness right now. And indeed, in fact, it is one of those levels of consciousness, a more grosser level. Uh, no, my question is more about the practical aspects of it. If I am in one and uh, I was... Uh, Maybe there's a purpose to being in one and I could be wasting it. So it's like uh, you getting an opportunity to, how to say, play for the national team and you wasting that opportunity, something like that. So mm. I'm not quite getting the practical part of this question. It's best one should meditate and find out. Okay. So verse 40 is a very motivating verse since it's saying to us whatever you do, don't worry, the merit will accrue to you, nothing is lost, even the most little bit of discipline, by discipline here is meant some sort of tapas, some sort of austerity, some sort of practice. Even a little bit of that will protect you, will help you. So this is the last sort of group of verses dealing with the theory. Now Sri Krishna expounds more on the practical aspect. He spends many of the verses to come on expounding on buddhi. For those of us who know the word buddhi, it means discriminative intellect. It means the one who judges and decides. There are various words for it. I will put a few of these words out. One nice word is conscience, your inner guide, your inner voice, your inner wisdom, discriminative intellect. Sounds a little bit more intellectual, so I'm not so um, happy about that um, translation. So very many different ways of um, translating the word buddhi. None of them, however, quite capture it. Hmm? 
very often the word buddhi in common parlance and day to day language in the indian languages buddhi the word is used in a different manner it you is used to mean intelligence very often and so very often when one begins on this path or when one is fairly fresh on the path of meditation you think buddhi is something to do with intelligence some people even misunderstand it and think it is something intellectual and therefore it is not something to be encouraged so this this idea is not correct buddhi is a very positive aspect and one of the most important aspects on the path of meditation for progress you need buddhi buddhi is your friend is your internal guide is the teacher within without buddhi you are not going to progress much you may have a good teacher externally who will guide you but even this teacher can only guide you to a certain extent the teacher without a teacher externally can only take you to the teacher within if the teacher within is is dull has not been sharpened then you cannot progress into deeper meditation the teacher externally can give you practices and say yes perform asanas perform atma vichara practice um, pranayama do some meditation but what do you do in meditation in meditation you need buddhi so verse 41 says o prince of kurus there is only one discriminative wisdom and the intellects of those who do not have such a decisive wisdom are unending with many branches many of us have heard of the word or the term one pointed mind it is probably one of the most misunderstood terms in yoga meditation <clears throat> and the reason for this is that there are a lot of intellectual schools yoga schools that have teachers training programs that teach yoga sutras and in yoga sutras one pointed mind is defined as a thought that keeps flowing one thought and only one thought flowing in the mind is called a one pointed mind and that is indeed the excellent technical definition of a one pointed mind a scholar a pandit will define it like this how will a meditator define a one pointed mind for the meditator a one pointed mind means a mind that has resolved its internal conflicts antakarna that is made up of manas buddhi chitta and ahankara is all well coordinated that means that manas is subservient to buddhi it follows the instructions of buddhi it is obedient it means chitta is also subservient to buddhi it means that ahankara is also subservient to buddhi all of these are well trained purified disciplined and accept the guidance of buddhi when all three are well aligned 
there are no internal conflicts. Such a mind is one-pointed. Such an intellect, buddhi, is a one-pointed, decisive intellect. And only such an intellect can lead the mind. If you do not have such a one-pointed mind, such a sharp buddhi that can lead the other aspects of antakarna, then you have a mind which is divided and scattered. This is how the yogis describe our minds, scattered and divided. The various senses of manas are going in different directions. Taste is longing to go in one direction. The, the sense of touch is longing for something else. Eyesight wants to feed, feast on, on certain sensory objects. So manas is scattered. Hankara has its own identifications, various identifications, and many of these identifications are itself in conflict with each other. And there's chitta, which has stored old memories, ancient memories, not just from this life, but also from other lifetimes. And it has stored regrets, it has stored anger, jealousy, self-condemnation, self-pity, pride, greed, a whole host of emotions which are very, very powerful. Can you imagine this mind is all over the place? It's all going in different directions, dragging you into the external world all the time. There is no peace. Peace is when you have no conflicts. Peace means having a one-pointed mind. Ekagra. A mind that is ekagra. So the paramount requirement for attaining a one-pointed mind is a very sharp Buddhi. <clears throat> Would you, you like to ask anything about this verse? Uh, Radhika Ji, this is Gautam. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so if I have understood this correctly, uh, one-pointed mind is a sharp buddhi which is able to discriminate between uh, right uh, and wrong and mm -hmm. having uh, the mana, uh, chitta and ahamkara under its control. But a uh, one-pointed mind would still be having thoughts coming and going. It's not about having no thoughts or having a single thought. Is that is, is that understanding correct? Um, the, your first part was uh, correct when you said... Uh that it is having a sharp buddhi where all the aspects of antakarna are coordinated. We prefer to use the word coordinated and not under the control of buddhi because control somehow implies something else. Control ends up being very rigid and the mind is too powerful. All these aspects are too powerful. So we need a very sharp buddhi to be able to skillfully manage all these aspects. Think of it as okay. the German football team. As you know, the German football team is very good. And the reason it is very good is because we don't have just one star in the German football team, but every single player is a star in his own place. Right? I know that not everybody is into football, but that's the first thought that came to me. And 
they all listen to their coach if one of the players would decide that he wants to go on his own trip and you know be special and he wants to always be the one who's shooting the goal and the guys who are supposed to be defending don't do their job then the team does not work it will not function right it's with any team game whether it's cricket or it's football any team game each player does his job at his own place so you need a leader and a good leader is one who can get the best out of everyone so control sometimes in implies a authoritative leader but for us buddhi is a gentle loving guide so he would discipline train manas for example lovingly to enjoy the sensory objects of the world but not to get attached to them right it would understand the importance of hari ahankara because it is a ahankara that relates to the world outside people relate to you gautam for example as a male right and that is one of your identities i am a male they relate to me as a female as a woman so that's one of my identities so these are also useful for our communication with the world outside so we see buddhi not as someone in control but as somebody who is guiding shri krishna is symbol of buddhi and the four horses are the senses the reins are manas and he is very skillful if he would hold the reins too tight in a very authoritative manner the horses would not be able to go ahead if it would be too loose they would all go in different directions so he has to be very skillful in how he he manages the horses so there's a great deal of skill involved in this so it's not so much control as in skillful guiding or skillfully leading a team uh-huh. and the second part of your question whether there are thoughts or not well initially yes there are thoughts it will first lead in meditation to a one pointedness with one thought coming which is your object of meditation which will lead you to the state beyond thoughts but these two one thought occurring all the time that object of meditation being in your mind all the time as well as the state beyond thoughts comes much later that is the process of contraction where you can go through if you are able to if you have that kind of sakal shakti to do that but that's much much harder it's not a very sustainable model of meditation in our tradition that's why we say it is important to work with the antakarna and to make the one mind one pointed sustainable manner by training all the aspects of the mind making your mind your friend and that is the path of expansion so we expand our awareness we expand our consciousness we become aware of the four parts of antakarna and then we come to the state of one pointed mind in meditation which is actually technically known as dhyana it's the seventh step in ashtanga yoga in the eighth four path right so we are talking about a very high level you know that the seventh limb so before we get to the seventh limb we need to resolve our internal conflicts prepare our mind and make it one pointed in the sense that everybody is on track 
Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to go inwards. But if your Ahankara doesn't want to go inwards because Ahankara is scared, Ahankara experiences fear. Or if Manas doesn't want to go inwards because it is enjoying the sensory objects of the world, then you're going to find it very difficult to sit in meditation and focus on your object of meditation so that that's the only object you have in your mind for some time until you attain Samadhi. That's not very sustainable. You can imagine that it's hard, right? Try to think only about the word mother, you know, your mother. Everybody has a mother. Think about your mother and hold on to this image of your mother all the time. How long can you hold on to it? You will find within a few seconds you will have another thought, another image. Is that... um, a common experience? I mean, would you agree with that? Yes. Yes, yes. yes that you cannot hold on to a thought too long, right? Yes. And uh, I think uh, the more we, uh, the more I try to control, the more uh, difficult it becomes. So exactly, exactly. And that's the part we are trying to say, that by controlling through force, that's not Sankar Shakti. That becomes a violent process of forcing your mind into doing something. Rather, work as a team, convince everybody, get them all on your side, and then proceed. It, it's it's much more satisfying and sustainable experience. Yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Yes? Uh, I... I... Yeah, I had one more, uh, you know, when, when you mentioned about Ahamkara, yeah. uh, there's a fear of, is it possible that the Ahamkara can disguise itself as, as Buddhi and... Of course, and try yes, all the time. <laughs> as, as we proceed into exploring the mind, there are many traps. There are many layers of the mind that, that Matthias just wrote about, layers. There are many layers in the mind... And initially you may think, yes, I I have this feeling, this is the quality of buddhi, you know, and I have a feeling of what buddhi is like. But then suddenly you discover that maybe that was not buddhi, that was ahankara. Ahankara, this is exactly what happened to Arjun, right in the first chapters where we talked about it and Arjun said, Oh, it's not right to kill my teachers. It's not right to destroy um, all my my relatives and friends. It's better to give up, you know, uh, than than to fight. What well, what shall I do with such victory? And so, that is um, a situation where. Arjun's ahankara was actually disguising itself as buddhi. That was not buddhi, that was not Arjun talking out of wisdom, but talking out of ignorance. So this is something we need to explore through practice and find out, analyze and find out is this really buddhi? Is this ankara? Is this manas? Who is this? And when one is not sure sometimes it can happen, then one can discuss that with one's guide. And that's by the emphasis on, on an external guide. At least in the initial stages until your buddhi is so sharp that... <clears throat> you have that confidence that you know you're not going to be fooled by hankara but this can happen even to the greatest of sages they have been stories of them falling you know until you have attained the highest become a sakshi become a witness 
attain that state, established in it, there is always that danger of falling. That's why we have to be very aware. We have to be very, very um, um, on our toes, you know, very sharp. Okay. So, uh, so Aham, uh, this is just one one last question. If I may ask, is that? Of course, go ahead. So, uh, as you said, you know, one has to be on toes. So, uh, which means that Ahamkara is going to be with us as long as we are in the body, because that gives me my identity with this body. So, uh, so there's no way that uh, you know when I when I've really developed my buddhi to very uh, you know a very one pointed mind. Uh, Ahamkara is there, but it's kind of working in coordination with Buddhi. Ahamkara never uh, dissolves or is, is never destroyed as long as I'm in my body. Is that, is that understanding correct? Uh, that's not correct. You can attain, uh, once you have attained and you're established in the higher state, there is Ahamkara, but you are not identified with it anymore because you are a witness. So the Ahamkara is there, but it has no power. But yeah. uh, it, it can come, come back if... Uh, Once you have attained the witness and you are established in it, no. But until then, yes. Maybe the question which I, I had in mind is, is it possible to attain the status uh, or the witness uh, point and then again come back to... Uh, a glimpse. Uh, you know, yes, I understand what you mean uh, now. You can have a glimpse of it. You may have a glimpse of that state of what it is to be a witness for a few moments, for a few seconds. There are some people who have been fortunate enough, um, privileged enough through um, their spiritual evolution have come to this point. And Sri Krishna just explained that, we, we just did it, where he said, if you are so privileged that the internal battle has come to you of your own accord without you having really done anything, you are an adhikari. It has come to you. You have not sought it out. It has come because you have evolved over many lifetimes. In the Upanishads, we talk about the self chooses the self. When that happens, then you have had a glimpse. When you have that glimpse, it's just the beginning. It motivates you and you say, okay, that's what I want. That's how it is. Then such a person will read the scriptures. He doesn't need to ask any questions. He has no doubts because he has already had a taste of it. You know, you don't need to have a whole, whole um, plate full of sugar to get the taste of sugar, right? You can just have a little drop of that sugar and you know it's sweetness. Similarly, when you have that direct experience of your consciousness, of being a witness, even if you come out of it, you are going to be a changed person. You are not going to be the same person ever again. So you will not, it's not a fall really. It is a complete transformation. And then such a person says, okay, I need to have a systematic approach so that I can go experience that pure consciousness and stay established in it. And that's how the journey would start then. It's a journey then to have a systematic approach. What happened just one time as grace, as kripa, must now through effort be firmly established. Yep, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Matthias, um, yes, uh, you need to expand consciousness. And this is exactly what we talked about, expanding your awareness. 
It starts simply with paying attention. In meditation, to whatever is coming forward. And it's a process that requires a certain amount of guidance. Unfortunately, we cannot <laughs> discuss that um, right here. That is something one discusses with the guide one-to-one. -one. Okay? Each person is different. Each person is unique. And we have to explain it to, to each person so that he understands it from his own experiences. Okay. I had a question yeah. on the term of mindfulness, yeah. which, which comes very often, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. So how, how is that in context of, of this here, of the uh, discussion about buddhi and consciousness? Yeah. Mindfulness is actually more a general term. And... Um, the way it is used mostly, uh, especially in many of the Buddhist uh, practices, it is a, um, used more as a technique of awareness and mostly used for breath awareness. So simple breath awareness is generally called in Buddhist uh, practices such as Vipassana, Zen Buddhism, um, is known as mindfulness. And it is nothing other than simple breath awareness. And mm. this is a technique. In general, from a yogic perspective, what mindfulness means is being aware all the time. And you mm. cannot be aware all the time because always the samskaras will kick in. We have so many samskaras that will keep popping up. So if you just try to pay attention, you know, to anything. I use the example of the mother. I said, can you just think about your mother for, for you know, a few seconds? We cannot even hold the thought of our own mother for a few seconds, you know. Within a few seconds, you will have some other thought. So, if you just look at, I don't know, maybe you have a pen on your table. If you just look at the pen, I have a pen on my table. If I just look at the pen for a while, I'm paying attention. Okay, we don't want to use big words like concentration but if I just pay attention to this pen you will, after a few moments itself, I suddenly notice that next to the pen there is a book so the mind has already moved to the next object mm. uh, and we, we are doing this continuously all the time we are not able to be with any one object. You may even notice that when looking at the pen, suddenly I am thinking about what I'm going to do after the meeting. You know, for example. So the mind is already in the future. Or it may go in the past. And suddenly you're thinking, oh, what happened yesterday? What happened five years ago? What happened in childhood? You know? Because that's the nature of the mind. It's going into the past, it's going in the future, it's worrying, it has fears, it has desires. All these are samskaras that keep coming up and disturbing us. So we cannot really be in the present. It's not possible to be really be mindful unless you have done the complementary practice. And the complementary practice is learning to go deep inside, going to the subtle, through gradual preparation of the mind, learning to go deep inside where it can rest, and then when you come out, you will find that it is much better able to be in the present, even if it's only for a few moments. Just those few moments of being present are real mindfulness. This is not a technique as some people are talking about, but that's the state of mindfulness. And that is a state we attain again, once again, when you become witness. When you are established as a witness, you are always mindful. But how can one attain that state of mindfulness 
just by saying, okay, now I'm going to be mindful. There are some teachers, many of them neo-advaitites, as I say always, they have nice uh, teachings, but they don't have lineages where they're taught practices. So they end up teaching, just live in the present. And people try to somehow force themselves to be in the present, but they find that they're not able to hold that for more than a couple of minutes is also already a lot. So they're not even able to hold it for a few seconds. And they get frustrated. They get, uh, uh, you know, they start condemning themselves because they think they are unable to do it. It's not because they are unable to do it, but they have not used the right method. So pure mindfulness without the complementary practice does not work. And it leads a lot of people to uh, the idea that, oh, meditation is too difficult. It's not, it's not for me. You know? And that's rather unfortunate. Yeah. Right. So we continue to the next verses. <clears throat> All right. So verse forty-two. This is the flowery speech that the unwise speak, absorbed in the discussions of the Vedas, saying there is nothing else totally identified with their desire, intent upon heaven, uttering the speech that leads to the fruit of karma in the form of rebirth, ample in specific rituals resulting in pleasure and power. Since they are attached to pleasure and power and their minds are plundered by that speech of theirs, their determinative wisdom does not succeed in leading to samadhi. So we spoke about in the verse before that it is buddhi that we need to take us to the highest level of consciousness so that we can become all seers, we become all witnesses, all become seers like the ancient sages. But if you don't have that buddhi, that sharp intellect, that sharp discriminative mind, what happens? You can keep studying the Vedas, you can keep discussing this flowery speech, you know, the Vedas are very beautiful, very poetic. And there are a lot of rituals given in that. And it is all about, these rituals are about satisfying desires. You want to have a child? Well, we have some wonderful mantras for it. You want to find a beautiful bride? You want a, a, a nice husband? Do you want to have um, a good job? <laughs> Well, we have mantras for it. That is what the Vedas are full of. The Vedas have major part of the Vedas comprised of rituals. And these rituals were used to attain desires, to fulfill the desires, to attain heaven. Heaven, as we've already mentioned, is a higher plane of consciousness. But it is not moksha. It will not lead to samadhi. It will not lead to ultimately to moksha, to freedom from the cycle of karma and samskaras. It will not lead to freedom from the bondage of birth and death. With such practices of mantras, of st intellectual study, 
you will only be stuck in this duality. This is not the non-dual state that Krishna talks about. This is not that state of the witness. This is not Sakshi Bhav. This is perhaps a higher level of consciousness after death. And still this will lead to rebirth. So this is what will happen if you do not have a sharp buddhi. Verse 45 says, The subject of the Vedas is the world consisting of the three gunas. O Arjuna, be free of the constituent gunas, free of the pairs of opposites. Dwell in the eternal essence, disinterested in worldly and otherworldly success, having cultivated the self. The purpose that is served by a small well as compared to water flooding all around. That much is the meaning in all the Vedic rituals for a son of God who has supreme knowledge. The three gunas are tamas, rajas and sattva. Our world consists of these three gunas. And they are always moving, always changing. So when we talk of three gunas, we are talking about the world. This duality, this pair of opposites, attachment and aversion, love and hate, hot and cold, man and woman, day and night, these dualities create the world around us. This is what the world is made up of. And this is the subject of the Vedas. Sri Krishna is advising Arjun to go beyond these dualities. He is not recommending rituals. He is saying, enter into the ultimate battle Fight against and destroy your own samskaras that are leading to rebirth. Go beyond these samskaras and dwell in that eternal essence that is the self. Do not be captivated by the lure of worldly and otherworldly success. Worldly success we are clear about. What is otherworldly success? The Vedas have many rituals so that we can attain heavens. And heavens means, as we talked about, higher levels of consciousness. And that is otherworldly success, to go to higher planes of consciousness. So much emphasis is placed on that in the Vedas. How do we compare this? This is described very beautifully. The comparison is the Vedas, for example, are like water flooding all around. There's water, it's all around. And what we want is something like a well. It's deep. It's not flooding everywhere. Is deep. So it compares the Vedic rituals with floods and supreme knowledge or that essence with the depth of a well. So you can see that the text 
is not uh, encouraging the ritualism of the Vedas. It is based on that part of the Vedas which is not ritualistic, the Upanishads. So, the Bhagavad Gita is a text that captures the essence of the Upanishads. At the same time, it does not condemn the Vedas, but it advises us not to be lured in by worldly and otherworldly success not to be captivated by this ritualism and other external practices, but instead to go into deeper meditation, confront one's own, own samskaras, allow these to come forward with the light of attention and awareness and allow them to be destroyed by this light or this fire of knowledge. Be purified, attain the one-pointed mind and finally become a Jivan Mokta, attain Moksha. So this is Sri Krishna much more uh, practical guidance now and we will continue with that next week and see how uh, the text develops a completely different character becomes far more practical and um, has a lot of Gems of guidance for all sincere seekers. Right. If there are no questions, then we can end here. Right, everybody then. Have a nice uh, weekend. And we will meet up on Sunday for Mastering Pranayam, for those of you joining in. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye. Have a nice time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Radhika Ji. Bye. Bye. Bye.